This is Getting to Know Your Bible, a program dedicated to the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's Billy Lambert. Several years ago, I received a letter from a woman who was in a, uh, a hospital because of emotional problems she was having. And it was one of the saddest letters I think I've ever read in all of my life. In that letter, she explained problems that she had had with her children, problems that she had caused, and how she had not been the kind of a mother she ought to have been, and how she had abused her children. And then I remember a question she asked, Can God ever forgive me? Can God ever forgive? Forgive me. I don't remember exactly the answer that I gave her. But it would have been something like this. Yes, God can forgive you. And our forgiveness is so important. That's the reason today on Getting to Know Your Bible we want to talk about the blood of Christ. And it is because of that blood we can have forgiveness. This is Billy Lambert thanking you for tuning in to watch today, to getting to know your Bible. And today on Getting to Know Your Bible, we want to offer a free Bible correspondence course. And what we'd like to do right now is pause long enough that you can find out a little bit more about the course and how you're able to take it. To help you in your study of the Bible, we want to send you this Bible Correspondence Course. This course is non-denominational. It's based on the Bible. It's conducted by mail, and it's free. To receive this course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama, 36580, or call toll-free 1-877-711-5214. One of the preachers that I have admired in my life, especially as a younger preacher, was a gospel preacher by the name of Gus Nichols. To me, he was one of the godliest men I think I've ever known and most knowledgeable when he came to the Bible. I recall one time him telling about a sermon that he had preached on the blood of Christ. And a man came to him and he said, Brother Nichols, I'd like to tell you a story. And he told this story to Brother Nichols. He said, while I was young, our family lived by the railroad track. And it was the task of my brother and I to go down the track every morning to get water from a spring and bring it back to the house. He said, one morning we went down to the spring to get the water. We were on our way back up the track toward the house. And for some reason, we did not hear nor see the oncoming train. But he said, our mother did. And she rushed up the embankment to the track. And he said, just in the nick of time, she knocked both of us out of the way of the, of the path of that train. But he said, in so doing, it cost her her life. And then he told Brother Nichols, the sight of my mother's blood on those tracks and rails of that train was not an ugly sight, but it was a beautiful sight because I knew that my mother shed her blood that I might live. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, we have these words from in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, 
cleanseth us from all sin. But what that verse is telling us is that almost 2,000 years ago that there was one who came into this world who lived and died upon the cross of Calvary shedding His blood that you and I might live forever. You know, the message of shed blood runs like a scarlet cord throughout the entirety of the Bible. From one end of it to the other, it's the message of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. In the Old Testament, it's by way of prophecy. In the New Testament, it's by way of fulfillment. But you know, that's a message that is very strangely neglected in our day. And it may be neglected for a number of reasons. One reason may be that some people think it is absurd to suggest that we have sins that need to be forgiven. And another reason being that some would think it a reflection upon our, our intelligence to, to insist that someone would have to die a vicarious death, that is to die in the place of someone else. But, but friends, as I present this lesson to you today, let, let me tell you what the Bible says. That the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. That's found in Hebrews 9.22, for, for instance. You see, God has often used blood in dealing with His people. Even in the Old Testament, that, that God used blood. Uh, in the sacrifices that the Jewish people offered, there was the offering of bloody sacrifices. They would offer animals as sacrifice to, on the altar. But in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, we're told that, in, that it's not possible that, that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Also in the Old Testament, God used blood to bring about the temporal deliverance of His people. I know that you very likely, if you study the Bible at all, are familiar with the story of the children of Israel being enslaved in the land of Egypt. And, and that's when God gave them deliverance. They, they were being enslaved and God heard the cries of the people. And He raised up a man by the name of Moses to become the leader and the deliverer of His people. Now when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush and, and commissioned him to go back to Egypt, he had all kinds of reasons that he ought not to go. But, but finally Moses, along with his bre brother Aaron, appeared before Pharaoh and preached that sermon that God gave to him. Let my people go. But Pharaoh's heart hardened. It was not until God brought plagues, ten in number, on the land of Egypt that Pharaoh released the people from their bondage or their enslavement. Now that final plague was the death of the firstborn of both man and beast throughout all of the land. And now God loved His people. He wanted to spare His people from that devastating plague. So He instructed them through His servant Moses to go out into the midst of their flock, find a lamb a year old without blemish, and to take the blood of that animal and to put it upon the lintel and the doorpost of their houses. And this is the promise that God made found in, the, in your Bible in Exodus the 12th chapter in verse 13. The blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you when I smite the land of Egypt. In every house that had blood on the door was spared the death of the firstborn of man and beast in that household. 
So God has often used blood in dealing with His people in the past. But the Bible teaches that all cleansing from sin is to be attributed directly to the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a fact and a truth that is taught not just in the New Testament, but, but it is taught in the Old Testament as well. For example, in the book of Zechariah, the 13th chapter and in verse number 1, Zechariah wrote, In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. There's a hymn based on that song. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And indeed there is a fountain flowing from Calvary for the sins of all mankind. Some 750 years or so before Jesus came into the world, it was Isaiah the prophet who predicted the death of Jesus. In Isaiah the 53rd chapter beginning in verse number 1, he said, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should, des should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. We surely hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but listen to verse number 5, please. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes, with His stripes, we're healed. In the New Testament, it was Jesus in Matthew 26 and verse 28 who said, for this is my blood of the New Testament which was shed for many for the remission of sin. And then the Apostle Paul wrote about the blood of Jesus in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood. The, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. And then in the second chapter of Ephesians, in verse 13, But now in Christ, you who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. If men are estranged from God, the only way that men can be near God is because of the blood of Jesus. In Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 8 and 9, listen to what Paul wrote. But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Being much more than justified by His blood, we are saved from wrath through Him. Saved from wrath through Him. It is the blood of Jesus that saves us from the wrath of God Almighty. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, in and, and verses 18 and 19, the apostle Peter wrote about the blood of Jesus. For as much as you know, they were not redeemed with corrupt, corruptible things such as silver and gold. In other words, you can't buy your salvation. You don't have enough silver. You don't have enough gold to buy your salvation. We're not redeemed with that. Well, how we're redeemed then, verse 19, by the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. It takes the blood of Jesus to redeem us from our sins.
to save us, forgive us, wash away all of our sins. See, the Bible teaches over and over and over again that all cleansing is to be directly attributed to the blood of Jesus Christ. I think it's important to know that when we think about the blood of Jesus, that His blood not only washes away all the sins of our past. Maybe you've been living a life that, without Christ, and, and if you would have your sins washed away in that blood today, then all of the sins of the past are forgiven. But you say, what about the sins of the future? Do, do, does that mean that I'll never do wrong again? Absolutely not. But now you're in a covenant relationship where you can have continual access to that blood, but it is conditioned. 1 John 1 and 7 reads like this, and this is written to those who have become New Testament Christians. If we walk in the light. You see, there's a condition. What is the condition? If we walk in the light. Now, there's a blessing if we walk in the light. Suppose I don't walk in the light. Whatever that means, whatever that suggests, if I don't walk in that light, then I don't have the blessing that follows. But this says, if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, verse 5 says, God is light. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And I believe this has to do with our fellowship with the Godhead in fellowship with God, in fellowship with Jesus, in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And when we're in fellowship with God, in fellowship with Christ, in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, then I can fellowship those who likewise are in fellowship with God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And if we walk in that light, as His in the light, we have fellowship one with another. I'm in fellowship with Godhead. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Somebody says, well, what does that mean? Well, the word cleanseth in the Greek language suggests a continual process of cleansing. If, and it's conditioned upon my living a faithful Christian life and staying in, in fellowship with God, in fellowship with Jesus, in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And, and then that blood keeps me clean. If you have a wound in the physical body and the blood begins to ooze out of that wound, that blood has a cleansing effect upon that wound in the body. And when there's a wound in the spiritual body of Christ, that blood has a cleansing effect upon it. Uh, there was a late gospel preacher by the name of Guy in Woods who was really a Bible scholar. But he used a very simple illustration to, to try to explain what this means. He said you take the windshield wiper on your automobile and as long as you have it turned on, it keeps your windshield clean. When you're in a, in a rainstorm, it'll keep the uh, rain off your windshield. But if you turn it off, then no longer do you have the cleansing of your windshield. And so long as we're walking the light, we have that blood that continually cleanses us of our sins. That's what happens when you obey the gospel and then you walk in that light, and you continue to walk in that light, then that blood keeps you clean every day of your life. That blood was shed for all humanity. Jesus shed it not just for a certain group of people, not just certain for a color of people. Jesus shed His blood for the whole world. When, when John 3, 16 explains that about as good as any verse. And I have an idea. Many of you can quote that verse. For God, say it along with me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But when I think about the blood of Jesus Christ, I, I think about the great love of God. And frankly, I'm at a loss to talk about God's love. I, I just don't have the ability to explain it in, 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 in terms that I think that really does it justice. But God loved us so much 
that, that He was willing to give the royal gem of heaven that you and I might be saved. What great love. I don't think there's anything in this world that compares to, to the love that a mother has for her child. A mother may see a child of hers in a, in a building that's burning. And that mother, out of love, will rush into that burning building to rescue that child. And in so doing, she may receive burns that leave her marked and scarred for the rest of her life. But she will never regret it. You know why? The love she had for that child that she rescued. Oh, but that doesn't in any way compare to the great love of God. Just suppose there was a disease that was spreading across the earth and this disease was taking the lives of people by the millions. And scientists and doctors from all over the world convene and, and they have unity. This brings unity to the world because they're trying to find a way to save the world from extinction and find a cure for this disease. And they come to the conclusion that if they can find a person with a certain rare type blood. They can take that blood, make a serum, and save the rest of the world. So they begin their search. And they knock on your door. They said, we'd like to test all of the members of your family. And after they do that, they come back and they say, we found the person that can save the world. And that person is your son. Your son has the blood that can save the world. Let me ask you, as a father and as a mother, would you be willing to sacrifice your son, your daughter, to save the rest of the world? I don't think you even have to answer that for me. I have two daughters and a son. And as much as I love my children, I don't know that I could sacrifice a child of mine like that. That'd be the most difficult thing I was ever called on to do. But my friend, that's exactly what God did. He gave His Son and let His Son die. You and I might live. You're loved. Some of you don't think you're loved. You're loved. Let me tell you, that's the greatest love there is. You may not be loved by your peers. You may not be loved by your family. You may not be loved by your soul. So that is, you may feel that way. But let me tell you, there is a God who loves you for the greatest love there is. When I think about that blood, I think about, I think about where that blood is confined. And that blood is confined to the spiritual body of Jesus. It's called the church. You, you know, the life-giving blood is confined to my body. And the soul-saving blood of Jesus is confined to the church. In, in Ephesians 5, 25, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. But in Acts 20, 28, the Bible there, Paul is addressing the elders of Ephesus, and he said, Take heed unto yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God which He hath purchased with His own blood. The blood is confined to the body of Jesus Christ. It is blood bought. Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 said, You're bought with a price. Oh, the blood of Jesus. If you're not a member of that blood-bought institution called the church, I, I'd encourage you to. Somebody says, Well, I don't know what to do, Brother Lambert. I'm, I know I'm a sinner. I just don't know what to do. What must I do? to have my sins washed away in the blood of Jesus. But let me ask you, what does the New Testament teach? I'm not asking what a preacher says. I'm not even asking you to take my word for it. I, don't, I, I would appreciate your checking me with the Word of God. Let me ask you some questions. What washes away your sin? The answer is found in Revelation 1.5. Unto Him who loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. But when does that blood wash away the sins of a penitent believer? The answer to that is found in Acts 22 and verse 16. And now why tarriest thou? Arise, 
and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What remits our sins? The answer to that question is found in Matthew 26 and 28. This is my blood of the New Testament, which was shed for many for the remission of sins. What remits our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, Jesus is in the remission business. But when does that blood remit our sins? And the answer to that is found in Acts, the second chapter, verse 38. The day is, the day is Pentecost. The question had been asked, what shall we do? And the answer is, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. What remits our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But when, is, when are our sins remitted for those who are penitent believers in Jesus? It's when they're baptized into Christ. Let me urge you to obey Jesus and do it as soon as possible. If we can help you, please call us. Now in the closing moments, I would like to give you a personal invitation to visit the Church of Christ in your community. And if you're not certain where the church is located, if you will call us, if you will text us or write us, we'll get that information. Also right now, pick up the telephone. Call for that free Bible correspondence course. And, and you can also take that course online. So whatever you do, however you take it, please take this Bible course. I want to thank you so from the bottom of my heart for watching today. And until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you is my prayer. We want to help you as much as possible in your search for a personal relationship with God. You can now easily access our free Bible correspondence course online at gettingtoknowyourbible.com. If there's any way we can help you grow closer to God, please email us at gettingtoknowyourbible at yahoo.com or call us anytime at 1-877-711-5214. Getting to Know Your Bible has been presented by Churches of Christ. If you have a question about the church, or if you would like the location of a Church of Christ near you, or to receive the free Bible course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama 36580, or call 1-877-711-5214. Join us next time for Getting to Know Your Bible.